everybody. My name is Matt Arnold, and uh, I am going to speak to you today on the uh, theories of adult cognitive development, uh, five stages that psychologist Robert Keegan came out with in the 90s. Uh, and if you're anything like me, you're also a huge fan of Douglas Adams. But if you're not, never fear. Uh, there will be plenty to uh, plenty to keep you engaged in this session as well. Uh, but this is Robert Keegan's book, one of the books that he's done. Uh, and I want to introduce that to you today with some humorous anecdotes from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where uh, he has a, state, a series of five stages that people tend to develop through, and he's really, really concerned with getting people from stage three to stage four, which we're going to talk about. This is the book that particularly concerns helping people get from stage three to stage four in their lives. This book is titled, In Over Our Heads, The Mental Demands of Modern Life. And then there's another one, which is The Evolving Self. In The Evolving Self, that's where Keegan really gets into the nitty gritty. It is an academic book. It's very long. It's very dense. This one is actually uh, far more approachable and it's a good intro to his material. But an even better intro to his material is comedy. Uh, so here's, uh, here's Douglas Adams. And I think you would have seen this during, in, in Hitchhikers itself, where Douglas Adams was also concerned with stages. And uh, the, the I, I think that I think that if he had lived a little bit longer, he would have encountered this theory if he didn't already, because this was in the 90s, and then he passed away in the early 2000s. Douglas Adams did. Uh, but a lot of these ideas were emerging in society around that time, and the fact that he emerged at the end of the 20th century was actually not an accident because a lot of people were seeing a lot of the same things. Uh, so, we have the, the stages. Here's a, here's a super quick overview, and I'm going to explain these stages that Robert Keegan uh, describes, where you have stages three, four, and five. And we are going to talk about one and two, but particularly in adult cognitive development. You've got what he calls the socialized mind. And you gain the ability to take the perspective of other people in your early, you know, pre-teens, early teen years, that starts to really solidify. The, the ability to take the perspective of other people gives you the idea of relationships, and cognitively you become better, particularly at math, in stages uh, three and four, but the, to relate concepts to other concepts, to relate people to other people, to actually step back outside of your own interest and perspective and take the, take the perspective of maybe your parents want, them, want you to call them at 11 o'clock at night, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the self author mind is, if you consider this a very teenage, a very teenage way to be, where you were just kind of like created by your social surroundings and all the cool kids are saying certain things. Well, let's say the people in your church all tell you that certain things are true. Um, they kind of construct you, and you don't have a lot of ability to think in terms other than at state the socialized mind, other than how you're being socialized. But the self-authored mind gets, here's the word, systematicity, which we're going to talk about a lot, because boy howdy, the contractors have a lot to say about bureaucratic systematicity. But in the systematicity, you start to have a self-authored mind, more and more and more, where you have reasons for things that are a structure of justifications that you hold to. And you hold to them even when the people around you don't necessarily like it. You're like, yes, I, I, I see that you don't, you, you uh, dislike me, sir, uh, but you know, swipe left again tomorrow, that'll be fine, but I'm going to have my way of seeing things, even though it is separate from yours. Uh, and you start to get to uh, thinking abstractions because now you can think in terms not just of the relationships, but in systems of relationships. Whereas at stage five, and this is all high level, we're gonna go into more detailed examples, but at stage five, you start seeing systems of systems. You're like, oh, here's this one way of thinking that tends to work whenever I'm at the bar, and here's another way of thinking that tends to work whenever I'm at church, and here's another way of thinking that tends to work when I'm trying to do software development, and here's another way of thinking that tends to work in such and such a situation. And you're like, you know, all of those are actually, like they say, all models are wrong. But models are useful. And to be able to nimbly switch between models 
And the difference between these is how you define yourself. What is there that is you, and what there is, is there that is just a part of you that you have that you step back from, and you look at it as if it's not you, and you're like, I have these things, but I am not these things. You are your relationships. But now you just have relationships, and you are your system. I am a, I, I don't know, there's, there's no such thing as a Robert Keeganist, but like if you were a Keeganist, you'd be like, that's what I am. I am a Robert Keeganist. I believe his theories, his abstract model is the capital T, truth. 42, life, the universe, and everything, right there. You are your systems. Here, you are the construction of meaning itself where you can actually pick between systems based on, well, what are the actual concrete circumstances at the moment, and pick between them. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail about that, because I think all of that was a bit high level. Um, Not really. No? Awesome. Well, I'm familiar with some of the, the concepts from uh, REBT. Cool. All right, so here you see the chart of objects and subjects, and Pika talks about this a lot, where the subject is what I think is myself. I, I identify with it. The object is what I'm actually stepping back from. It used to be the subject of what I was, but now I can actually look at it from a bit of a remove and actually think about it and consider it without necessarily super strongly attaching and making it myself. Where, like we said, here's enduring needs, dispositions, and preferences that you had when you were a kid at stage two. Stage one tends, tends to be infants, toddlers, uh, you know, like, single digit kids. Stage two has to be in that transition of the preteens, uh, or you know, like late, you know, seven through seven years old. And then you just were your enduring needs, dispositions, and preferences. But now you now you are your relationships. And now you step back and you think about your needs, your dispositions, and preferences. Well, let's talk about whales. All right? Remember this? Yeah. So, uh, when you're a little kid, we're going to step back from adult cognitive development, at least briefly covered kids. Uh, you're just this infant and you just have a bunch of sensations. You just are your sensations and things are just kind of happening to you and you just are that. But now at stage two, you can step back from your sensations, I'm hungry, or things like that, and actually notice consistent patterns about yourself. Oh, I've noticed, you know what, I tend to really hate that green stuff that mom tries to feed me. I've hated that repeatedly. I'm starting to notice a pattern here. Right? It's properly. Or what have you. Uh, I started to notice that every time I see dinosaurs, I get super excited. Right? So in stage two, you are your, uh, your preferences, your interests, you are your collection of Pokemon cards in the sense that Oh, stage two is all about lists. Just random associative lists of things. Every dinosaur, every dinosaur, every Pokemon card, every like, random associative lists are not necessarily structures like they are in stage four. Where at stage four, you have a series of justifications. But here, you're just getting over your, 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 your senses are something you have to step back from and your experience, like direct experiences to have preferences that are that are like patterns about you. Uh, so at uh, stage three, you start to see um, the the need for you to actually uh, take other people into account where you can take their perspective a lot more easily. Than you used to. Keegan gives the example that I mentioned a minute before, a minute ago, about some somebody in their early teens uh, who is still in what they call stage two selfishness. You're just thinking about your interests, needs, and preferences all the time, and it never occurs to you that maybe if you're going to be out till two in the morning, you should call mom and dad. And then you're like, oh, what? You get home and you're like, literally, you just literally weren't thinking about it. it slipped your mind. Why? Because you were having a good time. You were just relentlessly focused on it at all expense of all things. Uh, but in stage three, you become your relationships. Which lunch table you sit at becomes unbelievably important. Are you one of the guts? Are you one of the computer kids? Are you one of the which crowd are you in? 
So see how all of that is about who you are? It actually transforms into what kind of person you are as to which social surround you are a part of. And if they all say that something's true, I mean, you're a kid. What are you, but you gotta, you gotta say, you know, the people around me must know something that they can teach me, and you generally just soak that up, and that's just what you decide to believe. Cognition, according to Keegan, tends to take place a lot more in stories at stage three, and then in abstractions at systematic stage four. So uh, it goes from something deeply, deeply personalized in stage three to something deeply depersonalized and idealized and abstracted at stage four. We have trouble interacting. We have trouble interacting with systems, uh, both in ethics, in relationships, and in uh, pretty much every part of your how you're socialized. So the uh, what, there's stage three and a half because now we're going to start getting into half stages, and so in order to cover those very uncomfortable, awkward, and unpleasant. Uh, transitions, I need to talk about switchbacks. And this is it. The, the idea that Keegan gives us is that, that there's a series of stages in your life, three, four, five, where things are actually going really well for you, and then as soon as it's not going well and you need to get to the next stage, your life tends to become really miserable for a lot of people, or it can, can go through a three and a half and four and a half are particularly bad times in people's lives. Because imagine we're all in inner tubes, and as we're all in inner tubes, we're just going along a straightaway, and it seems great. Everything's great. I'm a teenager. I just do whatever my friends think is cool, and I enforce that, and that's actually working for me really well. It is functional at that life stage, and the problem with going around to another life stage is that it feels like you're going backwards, uh, including when you get past rigid, MOGA-style bureaucratic systematicity. It happens again. Uh, so. You get into these whirlpools, you get into these switchback eddies, and as Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy said, Galaxy said, eddies, eddies in the space-time continuum. And Arthur replied, is he? Is he? And so there are there are eddies in your progress where you feel like, oh, I'm about to get into like seeing things through, seeing, for instance, justice. Justice is now seen through at stage four, procedural justice. There are rules, there are ways in which we have the rule of law and we operate through certain principles uh, and everything in your life has to be structured now at stage four through through things like what you said you would do that whereas before at stage three at stage three you tend to see things just through whoever is feeling the strongest emotion in the moment so here's relationships for example your relationships at stage three everybody is infinitely responsible for everything about everybody else. And at stage four, they're not. At stage three, you are gonna be like, whoever is standing in front of you crying is going to take precedence over all the agreements you made. So stage three people tends to be something came up people. There's something came up people in the sense that, I know that I agreed to give a talk at PendleCon at 5 p.m. in EMC3, and I agreed to show up and give that talk, but someone else had a stronger feeling in the moment, so something came up. There's a sense that you are infinitely responsible for the care and nurture of all the people around you, which then like makes you completely unreliable and flaky. And at stage four, you have the ability to have the somebody else's problem feel from hitchhikers. And some of that's not my problem is stage four language. That's not my problem is not stage three language. Honestly, working on PendleCon really solidified stage four for me because I had to do a program book and I did the schedule book ever since 2004 and people would be late to it. And I had to set deadlines and stick to them and it was hard at first where, oh my God, oh, I'll just drop everything. But like, Getting it printed takes a certain amount of time at the print shop, and that tr this is the kind of thing that Keegan says that when you enter either the military or an employer or the university, typically those are three ways that people enter systematicity, where you know what, there's just going to be a time when you have to do the thing you said you were going to do, because if you don't, nothing gets done and the whole thing collapses. And this gradually changes a person's mind 
to the point where they get their own internal structure, where you say, we agreed that we were going to do this thing. Why didn't you do that? Or they're going to say something like, that's not my problem because we have a division of authority and responsibility. And what is a division of authority and responsibility in a structure? It's a system, a stage four system. This is a distinction between stage three and stage four that you get into. Um, you have a system of principles, projects, and commitments um, I identify with this system that I've created in the workplace. I feel good about it. Let's say. Let's say you've created a system in the workplace. So let's let's talk about, uh, sorry that this is not a Hitchhiker's kind of thing, but the movie The Matrix. There's a scene where Neo gets called into the office. He hasn't gone into the Matrix yet. And his, his boss is calling him on the carpet. It's an extremely stage three scene. Because in stage three, the only way that you can see systems they're like not sympathetic to you, they're just being mean. They're insufficiently sympathetic. And because they're just being mean, Neo's boss calls him into the office, and you had a squeegee window washer in that scene. Remember that? Outside the window, they're cleaning the window, and his boss is talking, and the squeegee is going, <coughs> right? Because that's the only way that a person at stage three can perceive. The concept that unless you structure things that people have to have stuff like I don't owe you the things that you owe me is not symmetrical. I'm paying you money. I don't owe you any work. You pay me work. I give you money. It's asymmetrical. And that becomes like it's very, very challenging as a sort of like family relationship style of cognition to even cope with that or perceive it as anything but a selfish imposition. So here's where we get into the problem with the switchbacks that I mentioned earlier. At the switchback, you think you're going backwards. Because at stage three, you were a virtuous and good person who cared and loved everyone. You loved everyone at all times, infinitely. You would drop literally any commitment you have made in order to help someone because you love them that much. You are a good person. This looks like stage two selfishness. And that's the problem. Because you get into that here again, because in stage four systematicity, we haven't talked about stage five yet, but you're absolutely having a hard time here because stage five looks like a bunch of immature stage three liberty givens and spiritual mystical woo. It will very typically be a clash between, I'm really suspicious of this because it looks like it's, this looks like it's stage three spiritual loop. So in each case, you get into this problem because you don't want to go backwards and the thing you had before worked really, really well for what you were doing. And you think that it's going backwards, but it's actually going forward where it's complexifying. Now what Robert Keegan describes these stages as is a stage of additional complexity. And I want to be clear about this. This is not necessarily even necessarily being a better person. I haven't gotten into stage five yet. But to be clear, here's what it's not. Stage five is not a scenario where you are now a Buddhist enlightened being. <laughs> where you are now, everyone loves you and you constantly make all the right decisions. And you're all constantly great about it. No, it's just a better way to be a to be a fuck up in a more complicated way than you were before. But you absolutely, at each stage, have way more tools. It is wonderful to be at another stage, even though if you want to be an asshole, you still can. But you have the cognitive complexity to have the tools. What you gain here, you don't lose here. So you have this, you have this ability to take the perspective of another person and actually feel their feelings. You don't lose that here. And those who do kind of seem like they're losing that are mostly just live action role playing losers. Mm -hmm. It's because they have to have, no, listen, it's the system. I'm sorry, the system has to be this way, says the MOGA. Um, at each stage, you don't lose the capacities that you gained at the previous stages. And that's really, I think, encouraging and helpful and something that in, in, in over our heads, he really wishes people understood for it, that you don't have to be afraid of it. Uh, so let's talk about that, like these, like these half stages, where you're really struggling. Here's uh, uh, what I consider stage three and a half. Uh, you get people who are really, they need to become systematic. They're like, you know what? I have a system, the, abs the cosmic absolute. Um, 
in stage four, you'll get systems like Soviet communism, um, the free invisible hand of the free market, uh, what else, my religion, uh, all of which are very functional in the context. Systems are actually a good thing. But you're like, no, the answer to life, the universe, and everything, there is exactly one answer. And it is this one. What's the question to, so stage five? What's the question? Uh, and so you start to use capital letters where you're really struggling because like your real reasons for things are just that the other people who you like on social media told you that it's good. And you start putting capital letters on that on things which is a very strong sign that you're struggling with stage three and you're in a lot of pain. And trying to get to the point where there would be some kind of system, but all you can do is live action role play them right now. So that's stage three and a half. And at stage four, this is the slide that made me think of this entire talk. This entire talk, because stage four is, I have a system which is definitive. Reality is frequently inaccurate. Uh, which over and over and over, like I have made, I want to say like 15 different years of Michael Thomas program books, and all of them were wrong. <laughs> Every single one. So I would announce at opening ceremonies, this is our work of fiction. We're nominating it for a Hugo. But this is definitive. If somebody is doing something that is not this, that is not the actual thing. This is. So that was a frustrating time. Uh, and the problem with stage four is that you become so identified with your system because it's helpful and it tends to work really well and provide a lot of value that you absolutized it a lot of the time. So that's one of the pitfalls that you can tend to get into. Uh, also, I talked about the somebody else's problem field thing before. And it is a good thing to be able to say, listen, we have a division of authority and responsibility, and your failure to plan enough to get me your talk in time for me to put it in your bank account program book, I can't hold up the bus for everybody. I'm sorry. The ability to do that is actually really important. But also, uh, if it's the somebody else's problem field that can cause you to neglect documentation on your software project for years, or just be like, this isn't working, but we're just going to pretend that it works like Bogots, we're just going to keep pretending forever. Because we have this, we have a JavaScript framework, we have whatever it may be. I just, as a software developer, I see this constantly. The somebody else's problem field means I'm not even going to work here by the time this becomes a problem. You know what I mean? which is not stage five, that is stage four. Um, because every model, every system that you can apply, we're gonna give it some concrete examples in a minute here. But every system has its limits and runs up against edge cases and runs up against things that are just like, don't work within it at all. And if you're like, no, but I have the system, which is the way to life, the universe, and everything, uh, you can just cause, cause you get in a state of constant pretending. You're just pretending all the time. Right. And that causes you to get into the total perspective vortex. <laughs> um, once you, and this is from the book where you would step into the total perspective vortex and it would torment you by showing you the scale of the entire uh, universe since the Big Bang and a sign saying you are here and the tiny, tiny scale of yourself and cause you to go insane. Now, at four and a half nihilism, um, generally, keep in stage four and a half where systems are breaking down but you don't know how to nimbly switch between them based on context, uh, tends to be a really miserable time and they call it nihilism. And nihilism is a vague cluster of concepts and I understand that, it can mean a lot of different things. But you are getting meaningfulness in relationships, meaningfulness in organizational structures, meaningfulness in ideology, meaningfulness in how you associate concepts between each other in your mind. And for those to break down is incredibly depressing. And it can literally, like, I'm not saying it's necessarily like clinical depression, but it can be sad. It can be sad and lead you to an aimlessness where you're like, well, does, does, does nothing work? And no, the answer is you can't have anything that is clear, perfectly clear, perfectly distinct, perfectly certain, there's always going to be something tripped up by what's called nebulosity. So when you're in an eternalism, now in eternalism, uh, in my podcast, the Fluidity Audiobooks podcast, we talk about eternalism versus nihilism. 
where in eternalism, everything is perfectly clear and distinct, and it is given a particular meaning by, let's say, the cosmic absolute, or, or God, or, uh, or my political ideology, or my religion, or, or any, uh, any number of things that it could be. Uh, it could be Ayn Rand, it could, it could be all kinds of things. But the point is that everything is given a specific meaning. And once you start to see like the, the, the edges wobble of that, then you can't be like, well, you know, that's mostly accurate as far as it goes. It's mostly accurate in particular circumstances. It's mostly accurate on paper. It's mostly accurate for certain purposes. You can't say that in internalism. It has to be this meaning or else nihilism. Uh, and which, ironically, a lot of people will wobble back and forth between that kind of eternalistic insistence and a kind of like nihilistic depression in a matter of weeks sometimes. And that is that wobbling back and forth where you haven't gotten the really thick say stage five yet, where you're capable of speaking a bunch of different languages as to how to figure out a meaning of a particular situation you have in it specifically. So this is a moment also to talk about Zappa people brought centuries of total perspective vortex. And he was the one person who came out of there and thought, like, aren't you like mentally destroyed? You know, there's no groovy man because I just told me I'm the center of the universe. Uh, and this is an example of, honestly, stage five can be kind of even, uh, it can be both, you're not guaranteed to be a good person. The Zaphod, in some ways, is super, is super mentally deficient guy, but in other ways, he is pretty capable of switching frameworks when he needs to, and you actually can get kind of predatory a little bit. So, um, what, you, what you're doing is the ability to set up status games for the stage threes, and stage fours to play to make themselves better and worse than other people, you have transcended meaningfulness itself at stage five. Which means now you recognize it's just a game and you can write games like um, uh, David California on The Office, the sitcom The Office, where he listed half the characters on that sitcom on one sheet of the side of the paper and then drew a line and then drew the other half of the people. He didn't put titles on the columns, he just left that sheet of paper around for them to find that it's really insane. He was a sociopath. <laughs> That's what I'm getting at, where you actually, that kind of way that he was trying to construct meaningfulness of, are you a good employee of Dunder Mifflin? That's a meaning. And he gained the ability to create games for other people to play, as opposed to just being like, it's valuable to be able to step back from your fixed, absolutist meanings. But not if you're going to do that. So that's my caution, don't be that hard people. Right. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a few more of these slides. We talked about relationships, uh, the subject object, and then the relationships, and then ethics. All right, so in the communal mode, uh, the communal socialized mind, Things about ethics in terms of compassion and consensus. So if everybody in the group isn't in agreement about it, and the struct the like the more structured people in the organization are saying, yeah, but the group needs to make a decision, they'll be like, no, we have to have consensus. And the whole thing turns completely paralyzed. Because of the demand for consensus it can't be me. It's not nice. It's not nice because you're violating the relationship. And remember, that's the stage at which you're constructed entirely by, do other people like me? I am good if other people like me. They are bad if I don't like them. And that's entirely like created by your social surround that you lose yourself in. Um, so David Chapman, who writes the book that I'm narrating in my podcast, talks about his Buddhist community where he would have this happen constantly. Nobody would be, like, nobody would actually do the things that they were supposed to do, and it was mean to say otherwise. And I'm like, oh my god, you're describing my hacker space. <laughs> where, yeah, where that was, it's, you have to have consensus, even if it paralyzes you, and there's no way to make decisions. But in systematic mode, of the self-authored mind, the uh, self-authored mind says, no, I am my principles, my projects, and my commitments, and I have a certain structured set of usually consequentialism. Like, there's a bad outcome if we don't actually make this decision as a group, and that outcome is worse than your feelings. I care about your feelings, I really do. But the outcome of us not being able to decide what we're doing as a hackerspace for a fucking year 
because we have one dude who's constantly saying, who's constantly shooting down everything and we're going to let it, is worse than his feelings if we just say, we're going to do a thing and he's not going to meet your preferences. Sorry. Yeah. So are you saying our juror system's at stage three? Uh, which system? Our juror system. It, it can be it can be played at stage three. But the nice thing, of like especially by a very skilled lawyer, I think they play it. They can make can kind of play the system. But the legal system in general has to be profoundly stage four. Stage four. Procedural justice. You have certain responsibilities to do things, even if you don't like it. And there are certain abstract principles. Those principles can be absolutized, like we talked about before. And at stage five, those principles can be. You can say, yes, I have that principle, but this is obviously an exception. Here's where another principle applies. Uh, there's the thing where you can play a game, and I wish I had some examples of them, but you can play a game where you can give a bunch of old adages and proverbs from history, where people would say these proverbs, and they're famous common knowledge proverbs, completely contradict each other. And the game is just coming up with lists of old adages that are actually really good advice and which contradict each other completely. And it's about stepping back from just having a principle I always, always, always believe in absolutist free speech, which is good, <laughs> up to the point where it's a fucking disaster. <laughs> There's any any principle you can name. Yeah, Bruce. Look before you leap, and he who hesitates is lost. Yes, both of which are true. Both of which are excellent advice. Excellent advice. Uh, so we have nebulous yet patterned collaborative improvisation. That's super vague and abstract, and I'm sorry, but that's what it's about because there really are most of the time, you know, he who hesitates the boss, look before you leave, those principles, it just depends on what is the actual set of circumstances. Why did somebody have that problem? And what were they trying to solve that maybe that corresponds to my situation in the actual lived experience, not just all completely abstract, where I'm shutting my eyes and sitting in an armchair with my eyes shut and saying, for first principles, we should do this. So think of it as a map. Uh, imagine if on Google Maps, you just took the instructions, but no street names. You have to go 300 meters and turn left. You have to go 500 meters and turn right. I have this kind of problem in software development all the time, where we're actually, you don't use the map and you don't look at landmarks around you and saying, now we got off course. So if you make the wrong turn early on, all the rest of the instructions are just getting more and more wrong. And so we have these, logs, these server logs, or these error logs that, that in software development that we ignore. Why? Because there was a time when we desperately needed to add an additional log to it to be logged. And then we stopped needing that, but oh, we better leave it there just in case. And now it's such a stream of noise, everyone ignores it. But if you actually are constantly keeping up with what's called the meta-rational work, the meta-systematic meta-rational work of saying, you know what, we don't need those logs anymore, can we make our stream of logs actually readable? That's meta system Because the system says just always do that. If you follow the instructions according to the system, you'll get the outcome that you should get. Not true. Because you have to constantly do meta systematic work uh, in many areas of life. And I'm only talking about software development because technical content is open source development. But it's so, so accurate. There's so many ways in life in which you realize, you know what? We have honored this this principle but it's not a sacred thing and we have to stand up and say in a meeting of an organization it's good we have that principle but look at the situation it doesn't apply to what we're going to do right now um, in any in so many different situations that they're doing this for us but i would like to talk about a few of them today. Uh, but let's also before we do that let's get to epistemology where you can put yourself in another person's shoes we talked about that in the systematic mode, you can take that perspective of a structured social system. I walked into my hackerspace, and nobody was there because of COVID. They would just release the ability to you know, go in with masks again. And this was like after we had had a lockdown. And I missed that place so bad. I missed it so bad. I, I would like to strangle most of the people there. I love them. They're my friends. They've been the world to me. But I would like to strangle them most of the time. But I love them, and I love the system. I walked into that building. I have a video of myself because I was so alarmed when I left that building and I taken out the trash and I turned off all the lights. Ah, oh, caring for my system, caring for it. And as I walked out, I turned back into the darkness. What was I about to say? 
I was about to say, I love you. To a building. <laughs> to a building. You have the ability to take the perspective of a structured social system. And now, in the fluid mode, you can relate systems to each other. Let's look at this one again. It's self transforming mind. Uh, I recently was on an airplane and I sat next to a pastor and he wanted to see, he wanted to know about my slides because I was going to fly to Philadelphia and get this talk. And, like, he was actually, he's a Christian pastor. Like, I, had, I was a fundamentalist back in, like, 2003, left it behind. I was super angry at it for years. But I had the ability to switch languages for him. And he actually got a lot of uh, out of this. And it is the ability to code switch that can actually take the perspective. And I'm about to give a few examples. Why does he care about this? And what is in it for him? And what is at stake? That's how you code switch. So let's talk about some code switching in the self-transforming mind. Uh, examples. OK. So uh, here's a relatively neutral example that will anchor no one. Uh, before we get into politics and religion, Newton and Einstein do not disagree with each other. But because almost everybody was in the stage four systematic mode, not almost everybody, but like when Einstein was alive, the world was so systematic in its nature and so incapable of switching that they thought that he had just made Newton wrong. Today we have very little, because we are constantly steeped in the idea, uh, and the ideas that we've been re that have been revealed to us since then, we have no idea how terrifying it was when Einstein was alive for people. They were terrifying. Up was down, water was wet, not wet, um, you know, cats and dogs. And it was a scary time to believe that truth was possible in a way that we can't relate to because it's just understandable for us that Newton describes the attractive force between objects and Einstein describes the curvature of space-time. Neither of one of them were talking about what the other one was talking about. How do you define gravity? It's both. If you are working at a scale other than astronomy and, you know, faster than light or like approaching the speed of light travel, generally Newton will be pretty good to engineer with. Uh, unless, of course, you're back down up at the third scale, which maybe I could have added up here, which is quantum. At that quantum scale, again, things are different. But why? The circumstances change. What did you need it for? It's purpose-based. Uh, and so try to keep that in mind when you think, well, what is the underlying idea or purpose or problem? So let's talk about religions. Uh, there's this book I recommend, God is Not One. The seven, uh, the, the eight rival religions that rule the world and why their differences matter. And his, Stephen Prostero is a, a, a professor of comparative religions. And his main thrust in that book is that each religion has a different problem to the human condition. So they have a completely unrelated solution because it's not the answer to life, the universe, and everything. 42, where you don't know what the problem was that you were trying to solve. So if your life is full of a particular kind of problem, maybe you should go find out what they had to say about it. But at different times and places in history, different cultures had different problems that were prevalent. And notice on here, Confucianism, where the problem was chaos and the solution was propriety in Confucius' system of etiquette, existed at the same time as Taoism, where the problem was conformity and the solution was spontaneity. Confucians in the Taoist time period wildly overcorrected. And Taoism was a response to that. The response to the system of Confucianist etiquette, where you would say, no, listen, we need, this is so much conformism, we need to get some spontaneity and authenticity. Uh, so a lot of the times when you look at any person, especially on Twitter, who is saying something that seems completely bizarre, it's funny how much sense making I can do by realizing that they have lived a life in which almost every experience they've had is something that I have never experienced even once. And that the normality for me that I have experienced as I've had my social surroundings and the kind of people who filter in and filter out of my life, where I never meet even one of the people they, they talk about. They're like, 
Why is it that everybody demands to constantly control their children all the time in a way that is totalitarian? We shouldn't make them go to school. We shouldn't let them do whatever they want. And I'm like, that, uh, and that's a movement called the Taking Children Seriously Movement. And I was like, huh, that person has had a very serious problem, and I have never met even one of those people. Because that has never been my experience, but it is a real thing, and it exists out there, and somebody had that problem once, and it matters. Uh, and so to take that person's perspective, and to realize that's why they're kind of like absolutizing it, because it was such an important thing, and they solved that problem so well that they're like, no, fuck you, any other contradictory uh, contradictory value or thing that you might want to pursue at the expense of that, I will never support. You do this a lot. To never support something that is against the thing that has become sacred to you, where you have placed that thing that's sacred at the expense of all of the human values because it's so precarious that if somebody threatens it, again, eternalism, if somebody threatens it, you think that it's all going to collapse again. So if somebody's like, no, this, it's really good that you have connection or salvation or submission. Well, okay, it's great that you have that thing, but what if we like temper it a little bit for the situation we are in instead of the problem that we need to better it solve? Because we're not in that right now. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, that's where you get into an eternalist form that then absolutizes a value that was completely good. It's not that the value is bad, it's that the value has been absolutized. Um, so, Let's talk about politics um, very briefly. And then we'll talk about questioning the in itself. I look forward to that. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, did I not? Huh. I'm sorry. Didn't make that slide. Okay, I'll just tell you about it. Okay, so in the slide about politics, uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, had a um, moral foundations study that he did where he defined, he tried to find out the underlying five ethical values. Like, if you could call them like the, the, the most basic values, of which all other values are combinations and specific. Uh, and then there were two of them that progressives tended to like, which were fairness and crime prevention and uh, care. And then the, um, uh, a, a lot of people who identified as preservatives tended to like loyalty, um, authority and purity. And all five of those things are more or less good things. And generally speaking, when it turns into a problem, is when it's so absolutized that absolutely no room can be made because you have to have that thing to solve the problem that you've been living with your entire life because that's so threatening. That the idea that maybe now is not a moment where that's the most important principle and maybe you should give a little bit becomes impossible. Uh, and he also talked about uh, the uh, a lot of libertarians identified with the concept of, uh, of freedom versus coercion. That that was a, again, freedom is an inherently good thing. So it's a matter of what is there that you have absolutized at the expense of all the possible values that you can think about in a compromise. And it's impossible to compromise between people. Uh, so let's talk about what about um, the theory of Keegan's five stages of trust. Uh, because it is, and Keegan will be the first to tell you, his model is just a model. Don't eternalize it. Don't absolutize it. Here's Ken Wilber's alternative model. Um, uh, I don't have time to actually go into it. If you want to talk to it, uh, Bruce is expert. Well, I don't know about expert, but certainly more than me. But Ken Wilber's model is very interesting. It's great. Uh, so there are other ways of structuring development. And more importantly, it's not, keep in mind that Keegan is only talking about cognitive development. And the developmental researcher, Zach Stein, has his own model of development, but he's also got a model of ensoulment and he's got a model of transcendence. So it's a matter of, with any system that you've got, well, what is its purpose? What is its context? What's the problem that it's originally trying to solve? This is how you do meta-systematic work to constantly maintain your systems, because we need systems that are actually good and important, and we need them, uh, and then we can't just be them. Do you understand? That's again the object-subject, the subject-object thing, where you had, you were your principles, projects, and commitments. You are your system. Now, instead of subject, that is object. You step back, and you can evaluate and appraise it based on the specifics of your circumstances, or 
what you've learned since then, or how can I complexify it, or uh, how are there other ways of looking at it? Now, I don't have the meme, but there is a uh, uh, there's a meme out there about the number six. And somebody's looking at it saying, that's a nine, and somebody else is looking at it from this direction and saying, that's a six. I think that meme is pretty good, but also oversimplified in the sense that here, here are different ways to approach um, the, stage, the stage three way to approach differences like that is a serious shortcoming. In that you say everybody is all equally correct. It's not true. Because any systematic person can tell you if you step back from that chalk or that paint on this on asphalt and you look for other numbers in a line, that could be one, two, three, four, five. And now you know which direction is up for the nine or the six. Like there exists systematically an answer that works better for certain purposes or for certain functions or for certain circumstances. So at a stage five sense, for certain circumstances, yes, they are both correct for certain purposes perhaps and certain needs. But there are plenty of times where they're just flat out wrong. Let's look at the religion one again. Because the problem with what's called Kazenialism is a stage three approach to resolving conflict. Keep in mind that these stages are just how you resolve conflicts. And perennialism says that all religions are actually teaching the same underlying fundamental truth. And just like Stephen Botero said in his book, any of the adherents of these religions are not thinking that you're doing them a favor. By you're really just saying, let's all just get along. And you see this in politics as well, as it's like a, uh, a way to resolve the conflict that doesn't resolve the conflict. It just says, let's all move up to civil. Stage three is only concerned with harmony. Harmony, consensus, everybody stop feeling such huge emotions. Can't we all just get along? And what that is is plugging your ears and saying, la 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 la, I can't hear you, stop being mean, stop disagreeing with each other. All religions are, as you can see, talking about different things, which is why they actually really are doing something valuable for their adherents. And their adherents like them, and they don't think you're doing them a favor by saying that all religions are actually the source uh, from, from one thing and they're all talking about the same thing, which they're not. Uh, same, in, same in physics, uh, same in uh, politics. The way to actually resolve these is, as you see here, get, it, get down into the more specific detail. You listen more. You don't listen less, you listen more. Uh, and that's the only way to resolve conflicts is to see what is actually at stake. It is metasystematic to ask, wait a minute, what's actually at stake in this system? What's the system for? Uh, is it actually working? You can be, in stage four, it's just like, no, you're wrong. Stage four's approach to this is, I have a system, it is a structure of justifications, and according to that structure that I have internally, this is correct, and you are simply not in accordance with it, and therefore you are simply wrong, full stop. And at stage five, you're like, well, yes, but wrong for certain purposes. But you also can agree with stage four in saying, it's also true that you're not doing a good job in applying that system in the wrong scenario. It's actually not doing its job. It's actually, it is legitimately worse to apply one of these things in a place where it should not be the thing that you select. Select from among it that day or in that, in that meeting. Um, a meeting of, let's say, the Pakistan Convention Committee where there's an important value between transparency and privacy. Those are both good things. I argued in favor of both of them at different times. If you absolutize it in good principle, which a lot of people do, oh my god, no, privacy at all times. There will be no transparency. And you see that a lot, where it's impossible because you had so many ways in which you saw a lot of harm done to privacy, where you can't see any other human values. You can't step out of that and say, well, wait a minute, what are the actual circumstances right now? Actually, we need to weigh how meaningful different things are. Again, we're going back to meaning. As we saw in eternalism, which fixates all meanings as pure and perfect. And nihilism, which is like, oh God, I can't even cope with this. It's all meaningless. Nothing really means anything. Why? Why does it not mean anything? And the nihilist will say, because it's not perfect, and it's not certain, and it's not absolute. And if it's not certain, then it's just all pointless and useless. Because if you hear this from nihilism, people, I, actually, there's no such thing as a nihilist, I should clarify that. People do nihilizing, which is uh, hyperbolic discounting. 
nothing really counts. No, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. And an endless number of reasons why nothing counts. So stage 4.5, where your systems broke down, you're like, everything was meaningless. Um, which you see a lot at the end of the hitchhiker scale. Nothing else. Uh, and everything was meaningless because you thought you had solid ground and you weren't going to have to constantly do this meta-rational work where you would constantly be like, it's constantly rolling and you have to stand over here, stand over here. Uh, and everything's just a jumble and it's a mess and nothing's worth anything. You can't construct meaning. Uh, each one of these stages is a relatively stable, not necessarily more complex, like each one is more complex, but each one's also stable. When you're not in the middle of that switchback, it is a stable way of constructing meaning. So it's a stable way that just destabilizes if these switchbacks right here. So it destabilizes and you have to listen to those why at stage three and a half to four and a half you feel like nihilism. Everything's just meaningless because the thing I was applying keeps breaking back. Uh, so I've gone through my slides, but uh, does anyone have any questions? No, uh, this is there's a wedding in the atrium at six o'clock. So we need we need Tinker Pound programming out of the EMC before that. Okay. If you found out this morning, I know. Oh, of... sorry about that. Uh, if we if we end this at uh, five fifty five on that one? Yes. I just need people out of the EMC. So I'll do my second round around five fifty eight. Get like Thank three to so five. All right. Yes. Um, I see that the there's a linearity in the small world that I'm a bit skeptical of. Is there room in his in his framework for asynchronous development? Uh, now, this is interesting. It's an area of controversy because Robert Keegan doesn't believe you can progress into different stages and in different areas of your life. Uh, I think Zach Stein does. And I myself, personally, don't agree with Keegan about this. I, I have seen... Uh, so we're going to be out of here for uh, four seconds. Um, if I may, yeah. there is a wedding going on in the atrium. Please do not use the stairs. We didn't know about the wedding. My apologies. Right. We will for sure do that. Thank you. Yeah, so I, the, the thing is, people will point out, while there are areas in your life in which you're clearly really good at stage four, and others in which I see you clearly at uh, stage three. Now, honestly, half the people in my hyperspace are deeply and intensely stage four in, in technical skill and systematicity in many areas, and deeply stage three in most of their social lives. Uh, and so that's like it's it's a controversy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering about stage five. You were showing the one slide of all the multiple different personalities, the little mini bees that make up the whole. That's one way to think of it. Yeah. Well, my background is in addiction recovery, so in smart recovery in particular. Yeah. Uh, I've also been doing a lot of, uh, what's the word? I'm a little hard to try and get words out sometimes. You have a question. I had a question, I lost oh. it. Anybody else have a question before we, uh, before we, oh, uh, yeah, well, between you, you and me. Oh. So that early 20s, you first, you've gotten into university, you're being exposed to a wider group of people. Uh, I've noticed a lot of very uh, focused directional thinking in that age group. Uh, would that be that switchback between three and four? In the 90s? Time? Yeah. That's what the, look in over your heads is about the catastrophe of the modern university. In the 90s, the ability to make these systematic broke down. And mostly the humanities departments are teaching you that systematicity is all bad. And the right. systematicity, if you have a system that only exists for the selfish benefits of the few to exploit others, and keeping university students rigidly within stage three as long as possible, um, makes it very challenging for them to uh, be efficiently work within systems like that. I, I wish we could get into so much more about this, but uh, time for one more question. Probably the worst one to ask because it's part of the question. How would um, neurodiversity neurodism. Uh, for example, uh, someone with autistic spectrum disorder. Yeah. Uh, well, you'll you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of comfort with systematicity, and 
Uh, this actually is a huge challenge to the linearity because of the fact that often the ability to define yourself through other people seems like it's it, it very poorly baked, baked in, right? But then the ability to define yourself by your system seems super crystallized. Um, I wish we had enough time, but unfortunately we don't have time yeah. for the wedding. It is five minutes six. But I would love to talk about anybody, uh, to anybody about this more after this panel. But thank you so much for coming, and I hope you enjoy it.